thanks a lot. Um, thanks for having me. I'm very glad uh, um, to be here, especially after the last, uh, the last edition of QNLP was online and it was such a pity that we couldn't meet. I'm really glad to be here. Uh, I, I, this is also probably the closest I've ever been to feeling like a priest or something like that. Um, but I'll try to stay here so I don't feel like I'm, like I'm in a karaoke, additionally. <laughs> okay, so I've been thinking, uh, together with some people in Innsbruck and so on, we've been thinking about um, what is the reach of universality and undecidability, and that's what I'd like to share with you today, our latest thoughts and developments. And I'd like to focus first on um, universality. So, for me personally, this story started by, um, with the um, fact or the discovery that some spin models that appear to be simple um, actually can simulate all other spin models, um, namely those that appear to be much more complicated, as in the 2D Ising uh, model with fields can simulate models on um, high dimensional spins or many body interactions or high dimensional lattices. And in this respect, this is one facet or phenomenon, or at least it is called universality in that paper. Um, now, I don't have time to tell you about the proof or like the key ideas of that proof, but if anyone asks me, I'd like, I'd be very glad to share them with you. But what goes on the, there essentially is the following. You have an object of study, a spin model, say defined on a hypergraph, and this is transformed on to a model defined on more particles, like it has plenty of auxiliary variables, but with simpler interactions, like with simpler building blocks. And the statement is that by fixing the parameters of these additional particles and coupling strengths, this second model, this universal model, can simulate the first one. And simulate means something like um, reproduce the low energy behavior. It has a precise definition, but it, essentially it means that it mimics the first model. And so we have actual and auxiliary variables. So in essence, this universal model has an extended domain. Okay? You can think of the additional part of the domain as the hyperparameters in machine learning, if you want. Okay? And um, the description of the original model is given, or is precise, is instantiated into the values, uh, so, so, yeah, into the element of this extended domain, okay, into, into the distribution of coupling strengths and um, um, spin configurations of the auxiliary spins. Um, of course, the, 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 the jewel of the crown, or the best understood and the, the best in many ways example of universality or of the type of universality that I'm trying to understand are universal Turing machines, um, which are, of course, a cornerstone of theoretical and um, practical computer science. And what goes on there is that imp you have a, a model of computation, take a Turing machine, but you could take any other, okay? And a priori, you have two things which seem to be very different. One is the program, T. These are the set of transition rules in a Turing machine, and the other is the data, namely which strings you feed the program, namely which question you're asking that program, namely the so-called instance, okay? Um, but, so if that were all, it would follow that for every different algorithm, you would need to build a new machine. But of course that's not the case because there's this uh, fundamental, really important notion of a universal Turing machine, which comple completely washes out this distinction because the program is now fixed, you, there are, there are some fixed set of transition rules, and it can run any simulation at the expense of enlarging the, um, the input, right? So part of the input will be the description of the algorithm it is supposed to simulate. So it's, 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 a, it's a wonderful idea, okay? So, so, so what was previously a program is now part of the input. So and a, and a Turing machine is universal when it is capable of reading and acting like another Turing machine. That's kind of the threshold it needs to cross in order to be able to run any simulation. 
So here we again have actual and auxiliary variables, namely the, in, the actual input and the description of t. And yeah, we also have some, we're also somehow using this additional part of the domain of the universal Turing machine to actually say um, what Turing machine it is supposed to mimic. In machine learning, we, have, we find a similar idea for feed-forward neural networks, for instance. Say you want to learn a function in some class, like continuous function, um, typically it's some well-behaved thing. And then there's a statement, this universal approximation theorem, that um, for any such function, there is a um, network with one hidden layer. Okay, sorry, for any such function and epsilon, there is a network on a given number of hidden units and a set of coupling strengths so that um, the function on the visible units here is um, epsilon close to your original function. Okay, so in this case, it's a, it's, it seems to be a statement about denseness and also there's something of a, the basis of a vector space in there going on. Okay, but Anyway, so we also have some visible and some hidden units and a distribution of weights and biases. Okay. So they all seem similar, but I would like to understand really how deep are the similarities. I would like to prove theorems and say one follows from the other or not. One is weaker than the other or they are equivalent because so much is known, for example, about Turing machines and the others are new and I believe that if we if we were to establish these rigorous links, we would be able to transfer lots of knowledge and stuff. For example, there's a full characterization of universal spin models, but, but there's no such thing for universal Turing machines. Why? Probably because they are different. Okay, so that's what I would like to understand. How are they related? And more broadly, I would like to understand the reach of universality as well as that of undecidability, which I see as intimately connected. And I, I'll have time to say just a couple of words about this connection here today. How? I propose to do so in two ways. Um, one is to compare two examples, namely the spin models and the Turing machines. And because I understand both very well, I feel, and I'm, I, I'm, yeah, I, I, yeah, I'll tell you how we do it. That's kind of a bottom-up approach. The other one is to propose a framework for universality and try to see how the different examples fit in the framework. And ideally, this framework will also give us grades of universality and let us compare things um, rigorously. It's a top-down approach. Okay, on the first kind of set of projects, um, that, that's what we do, we compare, so we cast spin models as automata or more, more formally as formal languages and we find that um, they are all at most um, context sensitive languages and what is to be done next, so it, it seems that the notions of universality are different and what is to be done next is to cast the morphisms if you want or the relations on the side of automata to operations on the side of formal languages so that we can formally compare their universalities. But I explained some of this in the past editions of QNLP and so I'd rather move to the new stuff which is a framework for universality. That's what we're currently thinking about. And I believe we need to do this in two ways. One is a con conceptually so that we can connect to um, maybe more philosophical texts and to linguists and to um, less formal notions of universality. And the other is formal, or in particular, we've categorical, we've chosen the, this framework of categorical, of category theory, maybe because of you, because of <laughs> your influence. Um, yeah, so I'd like to, to say a few things about this. All right, first of all about the, the conceptual framework. Okay. The conceptual framework starts, of course, with the question, what does universal mean? Well, it means relative to the universe. Okay. And by extension, that's something I, I learned from Martha 
uh, as, a, as a frozen metaphor, it means all-encompassing, right? So this is the, the key idea. Um, given a collection C and a relation R that lands in C, U is universal if U comma C is in the relation for all C, right? So, it, so what's important here is that universal is relative to a collection that we will quantify with all and a relation, which is this encompassing relation. And whenever you find this structure, it's a very basic structure, then you can call the corresponding object U universal. I'm not asking that U be in C, I'm not asking that R be transitive, reflexive, anything nice, I'm not asking that, that C be finite, okay? It's, a, it's just a very basic structure, okay. Let us see some instantiations of this structure. Well, in computation, of course, the first one are Turing machines. C is the collection of Turing machines, R is simulation, U is the universal Turing machine. Also, the completeness in a complexity class. If, you, if you've heard what NP completeness means, um, well, in C would be the collection of problems in that complexity class, R would be a reduction, uh, which could be a computable reduction if you're talking about RE completeness or a polynomial time reduction for NP completeness, and U is a complete problem. That also feeds our structure. A universal gate set is a little different. In this case, um, C is the collection of Boolean functions, and the relation expresses that for any Boolean function, there exists a sequence of gates from my universal gate set so that the two coincide. Uh, for quantum computation, it's also a little different. You would be the collection of, uni of um, unitaries of any size, and the relation R expresses that for any epsilon, there is a sequence of gates of my universal gate set, which is epsilon close to my target um, unitary. So as you see, there are some nuances in the, in the relations. In some, sen in, in some cases, there's an, an existential quantifier. In others, there's not. But they all fit um, this very basic structure. Uh, universality classes of spin models. Um, well, C would be the collection of all Hamiltonians. The relation would be flowing under renormalization. And you would be um, the collection of fixed points or the universal spin models, either in the classical or the quantum case. Um, yeah, so C would be the collection of quantum spin systems. Sometimes I distinguish, yeah, spin systems means finite size. It's a technicality of the proof, but actually it's correct to call it here spin systems. Um, R is a relation defined in either of the papers, not obvious, yeah, it's called simulation or quantum simulation, and you would be the universal spin model. In machine learning, um, the relation we've seen for feedforward neural networks about approximating a target continuous function, and there's a similar um, structure to be found in restricted Boltzmann machines where what is to be approximated is a, a discrete probability distribution. Uh, the basis of a vector space, of course. Um, C is a vector space. The, the relation expresses linear combination, and U is a set that contains a basis, so a generating set. If it contains a basis, then you say it's, uni I mean, it's universal according to this definition. Or the extremal point of a convex set, or the extremal rays of a convex cone, right, where um, C is a convex set or a convex cone, R is the relation of convex combination or positive combinations, and yeah, U is universal if it contains um, the set of extremal points or the set of extremal rays. Uh, well, there's also the universal graph in mathematics, which literally instantiates our basic structure um, for some relation, which could be like a minor relation or a subgraph. So there's also something called the universal differential equation, which is a differential equation whose set of solutions is dense in the set of continuous functions, I believe. 
It depends, there are like three or so. Um, okay, now the universal grammar um, is clearly also an example because um, in this case, this is the collection of all grammars of natural languages and the relation said, because so the universal grammar is not a grammar, it's a metagrammar, it has three parameters. When they are fixed, it specializes to a target grammar. So that is what this relation is expressing. Yeah, and use the universal grammar because it can specialize to any uh, grammar. Okay, now this is, a, I think this one is particularly interesting. The problem of universals in philosophy. Uh, very roughly speaking, it's the problem of how we can assign um, the same attribute to different particulars. It's a very old problem in metaphysics and some people said, well, um, different attributes share, different particulars share the same attribute because they both um, instantiate the same universal. That's what like, Plato and Aristotle would say. Um, and others would say, no, there are uh, universals do not exist, but then they run into many problems. Okay, of course, so, so take these universals in the, in, for these metaphysical realists, which are something very mysterious that lives in another world outside of time and space and it's immutable and so on. And now, of course, that relation, their relation with all objects that share that attribute is one of universality in our sense. What's more interesting is that <laughs> what these philosophers also thought about is that if you consider the attribute is non-self-instantiating, then they run into problems because it is, if and only if it is not. And this is precisely the core argument of undecidability. So in many of the examples I have in mind, the ones I showed you at the beginning, I think that there is a fundamental tension between universality and undecidability. And quite unexpectedly, this also appears here. So being very optimistic, this link may allow us to, I don't know, maybe say something new is a bit optimistic, but definitely kind of put this discussion and this tension in a broader context. Because this happens also for Turing machines, for example. Okay, we are doing this top-down approach. So what, what do we learn? by seeing how this structure is instantiated in so many examples. Well, we can now, uh, of course, we want to capture the interesting types of universality, by, but how do we capture that, right? Well, we can ask questions now, as in, um, which of these types of universality onsets the generation of complexity? Which means something like, there's a very, um, subtle jump to universality. Um, and well, yes, for Turing machines and for spin models, no for the universal grammar and, from, and for the problem of universals, for instance. So we're kind of coming up with a table of properties that each type of universality has or, or does not have. Or which is related to undecidability? Well, yes, again, the universal Turing machines and surprisingly this problem of universals, no, for the universal grammar, the basis of a vector space, the extremal points, and so on. And let me just say a couple of words about undecidability. I take it to mean or that no system, very broadly understood, can thoroughly talk about itself. Um, and so these limits, what can be formalized, what can be computed, what can be learned, what can be known, what can be said to be true, what can be said to exist. And at the core of all of these arguments, to the best of my understanding, there, there is self-reference and negation. There is, in essence, the liar paradox, which is very far-reaching and very, very powerful. And so intuitively, the link between universality and undecidability comes from the fact that universality allows for self-reference and often, also for negation. And so when one has one, one has the other. But making this precise is precisely our goal. I'll show you some steps into making this precise very soon. Okay, so, oh, here it should say categorical, I'm sorry. Now, now comes the categorical framework. 
<laughs> I, I'm not sure if it's the same because I'm not sure if everything can be formalized. So maybe that's like a bit of an ultimate question that I have. Yeah. Me, me, yeah. I don't know if everything can be captured with the following fr framework. Okay. So our central object is what we call a simulator, which is a map. It's a map in a category, but I don't think we need that here. Uh, of the form. So this is to be read from top to bottom. Each of these objects, P, C, and so on, are like objects in the category. So it's a map from programs and contexts to things and contexts. And it splits into two called the compiler and the context reduction. Um, and moreover, there's going to be like another map which uh, can be applied to things and context and gives rise to behaviors. And then a simulator is universal if for every thing there is a program such that for any context C, um, the simulator on that program behaves like or mimics the thing itself for all contexts. Perhaps it's not so crucial that you get all details. Maybe the main idea here is that this can be formalized by, in terms of some simulators. Okay, and we also, like, we relate simulators and we grade, uh, we can say this one is stronger than this other one. Um, but I won't have time to explain that because what I think is more insightful is to see a couple of examples. The Turing machine. Well, the programs are, are the set of programs. T is the universal Turing machine which can be taken to be a singleton. The context are the inputs to the computation. And kind of the, the key thing that happens is that SC, this, in this context reduction, the program becomes part of the input. It's what I explained earlier about the program being paired with the input into a longer string. And that playing the role of, well, doing both jobs, describing the, what is to be simulated and the input. And the behaviors are the outputs to the computation. Like whatever it is, these are elements in sigma star where sigma is a finite alphabet and star is a, the clean star, whatever you may, may want it to be. Also a universal spin model is an example of that. Uh, in this case, the programs are all spin systems. This, co uh, this compiler is what casts an eight-dimensionalizing or POTS model into a two-dimensional easy model. There is a map there, right? There is a map saying which coupling strengths I'm supposed to choose, how I'm, how I'm supposed to um, organize them, and so on. Well, that, that is the job done by this um, compiler. And so T is the spin model. Um, the context, remember it was previously the inputs to the computation, now it's a set of spin configurations. They play a similar role. Um, yeah, SC gives the spin configuration. And, and the behaviors are now the energies. It's what's observable at the very end. It's like the output of the computation. But also a dense subset is universal in this set. We have other examples, but this one is kind of funny. Um, if you want to express that the rationals are dense in the reals, then you can do so by choosing that the programs are rational and a precision uh, as the compiler simply inclusion into the reals. And um, the evaluation is going to map uh, a real and a precision into an open ball around that real with, with, that, with that radius. And so the statement that every real can be approximated by a rational maps to or translates to the statement of universality of the rationals in this setting. Okay, and now a few words about undecidability. And because that's something we can do with this categorical framework. Okay, so a function, or a morphism if you want, doesn't matter, um, from two objects A cross B to C is said to be weakly point surjective if for any G from B to C there is an A such that F of A is the same as G. Okay. 
So th this dash here means for all inputs, for all little b's in big B, okay? So in other words, um, so the last part of the definition can be said, that you, you can say it as um, the fact that um, A or F can represent G if there is an A that you can put in the extra part of the domain of F so that the two behave the same. And then F is weakly pointer ejective if it can represent every G. Okay? Now, Lovier's theorem says that take a function that is weakly pointer ejective from A cross A to B, then every G has a fixed point. So in plain words, if the function is weakly pointer ejective, then the G's cannot be too expressive, cannot be too general. Why? In order to avoid a contradiction. Okay, so the contrapositive form of, of, of this theorem would say if, um, if, G, if there is a G without a fixed point, like negation, then F cannot be weakly points rejective. And <laughs> weakly points rejective is like universal. Essentially, it's the same, and that's what we're trying to make precise. Look at what we're doing. We're enlarging the domain of F and choosing an element in this extra part of the domain so that F A behaves like G. And Lovier's theorem is the statement of undecidability. <laughs> because Gödel's theorem, the halting problem, um, the sentence is false, um, many others also, the fact that P and NP cannot be separated by means of an oracle, uh, Cantor's theorem, all of these follow from Lovier's theorem, can be seen to follow from Lovier's theorem. So in particular, for linear bounded automata, which are the next type of automata, like which are weaker than Turing machines, we show that eval, our function, cannot be weakly point rejective. In other words, there is no universal LBA, and therefore they are not bound to undecidability. But of course, for Turing machines, their eval is weakly point rejective. So there is a universal Turing machine, but then they are bound to Lovier's theorem. Um, in what form? Well, in the sense that there are undefined points, namely non-halting points, namely Turing machines can only compute partial functions. So I think that the trade-off is, is transparent here, and that's, that's what we're working on now and trying to understand this better. Okay, uh, am I too early? Speak slower if you want, got 10 minutes. Oh, 10 minutes? Oh, then I'll finish earlier and I'll let everyone ask questions and, and we can discuss. Um, okay, we're trying to understand what is the reach of universality. And the first way how we're trying to approach this question is by comparing two examples, more specifically by casting spin models as formal languages. Where we found, I didn't have time to explain that, where we found that um, effectively zero D spin models, the language of effectively zero D spin models is regular, the language of one D spin models is deterministic context free, and the language of all other spin models is context sensitive. And so that gives us in particular a new complexity measure for spin models that measure somehow the hardness of the local structure of the model. In other words, the grammar of, of physical interactions. But in particular, it implies, since 2D spin models are universal, in our sense of universal spin models, but, um, sorry, I forgot to say, Turing machines recognize recursively enumerable languages. As you can see, there is a mismatch. It seems that we, they are not at the same level. It seems that universal Turing machines are, are stronger. And that's what we need to understand and to figure out. And the second way to tackling this question is by developing a conceptual and a categorical framework for universality. Um, in the conceptual one, the central idea is that universal, universal means all-encompassing. And we have instantiated that in many examples and in many disciplines. And the second one has as a central object some simulators 
that can do some things. And I showed you a couple of examples. And I could end here or end with a provocation. Uh, okay. So I really wonder what are we to make of these limits of undecidability? Are we supposed to accept them? What are they telling us about everything about the world and the fact that they are so strong? And I don't know, I don't know how to make sense of that. And one thing that I don't understand is the fact that art seems to overcome some of these limits, as in you can do self-reference and negation in art. And also clearly our brain can understand that the liar paradox is a paradox, whereas a computer cannot. And yeah, some people have thought that, the, that it follows from this observation that the brain is more powerful than a computer. I think that's um, too quick of a conclusion. But I would like to understand um, yeah, the implications of all of these thoughts for, I don't know, for our thoughts, for art, or yeah, things like that. Thanks.